call, they won't say, oh wow, you're growing a beard, you're following the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa No, you're not looking good for da'wah. You're not looking professional. So they'll call, they'll use bad things to call something good. <clears throat> so I thought to myself, why did Muhammad Mawlud mention this as the first one? And my conclusion is that this prohibition of the tongue will undermine the sharia, which allows you then to engage in every other single prohibition of the tongue, even other types of prohibitions, because you've undermined the sharia. The average Muslim is not going to, is any Muslim going to say ghiba is halal? They're not. They're not going to say that. But if we call it by something else, then it's not ghiba anymore. Like one time I, I stopped a person, I, he started st talking, <clears throat> and then I said, well, I don't want to continue this discussion because now you're mentioning names. He's like, no, 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 this is not riba. This is scientific analysis. And so in his mind, he was like, well, what's this guy's got a problem with? I'm not doing riba. I'm doing scientific analysis of this other human being. And so by calling it by this different name, what has it ha allowed him to do? It allowed him to make amends with the fact that he recognizes ghiba is haram. The pro that prohibition is haram. But now he's going to call it by another name, and then it becomes acceptable. There's a, there's a concept in psychology called cognitive dissonance. Anybody read anything on this? And basically it's the idea that <clears throat> when we're faced with something that causes dissonance, causes this static in the heart, like we can't, really, it, we can't really accept it. So then, as human beings, we start a process of trying to... Um, um, what's that? Disassociation. Whether disassociation, I mean, there's a number of processes, but we're trying to resolve this. We're tr there's this static in our heart about a topic or a feeling or something. It's bothering us, and that's what the dissonance is. It's bothering us, and so now we try to resolve it. Now, the modern psychologists think that they've come across this great thing and they've coined a term. If we look at the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, when he described sin, an ithim, if somebody wants to know, like, what is sin? You're not going to have a mufti at every, single, at every single stage of your life, a sheikh, to be able to answer your questions. So what did he give us as a guiding principle to show us what sin is? What did he say? No, something more specific. <clears throat> Think of scratching. That's your hint. There's a hadith. He said, the sin is what scratches your heart. When I, when I saw this, when I started reading about this term of cognitive dissonance, and literally it's about like static in the heart. And <clears throat> the Prophet ﷺ over 1400 years ago, is, is telling us, giving us a description of what sin is. Our fitra, our ruh, is not going to accept certain things and it's going to bother us. Okay, so he's telling us it's going to bother us. So sometimes, um, you might get a fatwa. And this is a hadith about seek the fatwa from your heart. You might get a fatwa. And let me just ask the audience here. Have you ever experienced where a sheikh says this is halal, or you read a fatwa that says it's halal, and something inside you says, no, I can't. I can't. Have you experienced that? Listen to that. And this hadith is guiding us. The Prophet ﷺ is telling us, seek fatwa, uh, seek fatwa from your heart. This doesn't mean we go to the heart and say, okay, is this halal or haram? Hmm, heart, what are you telling me? Yeah, I think this is halal. Which some people do that. They'll go on their own opinion. What this is telling us, because if you look at the rest of the hadith, he says, even if the people give you fatwa. So I'll throw something out right here. If I told, here, we're all raised or spend a lot of time in, in, in the West or in America. If I served you a plate of dolphin meat right now, would you eat it? Would anybody eat it? Is dolphin halal? Yeah. It's halal, right? Can anybody come and tell you it's haram? It's from the sea. Right? It's from the sea. But it's bothering you. So if I come and I say, hey, it's halal, eat it. The Prophet ﷺ is always teaching it. That's not going to be good for your soul. It's not going to be good for your body. Don't eat the dolphin meat. Especially now, you know, environmental. And you can apply it to something else. If we were maybe in, in South American um, rainforest, and we were some of the Indians in the, in the forest, and we actually subsisted on some of those freshwater dolphins in the water, is it going to bother them to eat dolphin? 
No, but over here, you know, we have a different culture, a different understanding <clears throat> of dolphins. So it bothers us. So follow your heart on that. Look at what the people have said. And this is another guiding principle. You can read your fetwas and read all of these different fetwas, but help yourself, your nefs, develop by following your heart in what you feel is, 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 is healthier for your nefs. Now, if you do that, and you follow your heart, and you go away from those things that bother you, then you'll have a healthy development. But once those things start bothering you, then you have to go through a process of rationalizing them. So if we're engaged in riba, it's going to bother us if we're like, oh, it's riba, it's riba, it's riba. Well, no, it's actually constructive criticism. If I go to a person's face, and one of the co uh, topics that was covered previously by Sheikh Salik in this uh, si uh, series was bothering people. You can't bother people for no reason. So if we're bothering people by what we say to them, and we know that, and we know it's haram, then we're going to say, no, you know what, that brother needs to hear this. This is, I'm speaking the truth. So speaking the truth, speaking the haq, praiseworthy or negative? Praiseworthy. praiseworthy. Bothering another human being. Okay, so if we leave it in our hearts as bothering another human being, our heart's not going to leave it. So we're going to go through this process of resolving the cognitive dissonance, which is by one of the, the, pro, the, one of the ways is by switching the names upon things. And so if we, um, <clears throat> if we say, for example, um, theft, sariqa, praiseworthy or negative? Negative. Somebody might just say, oh, I came up. I came up on this. Or uh, they go into, um, uh, they, they, get, they get something, a check in the mail that's not theirs. Oh, alhamdulillah, I'm, I got lucky. I'm lucky. Well, lucky is a, good, is a good concept. You know, the little lucky charms and the leprechaun and so forth. But no, it's not, you're taking somebody else's haq. So do you see that, how that, this concept is working? So that's why I feel that this, the reason maybe, Allahu Alam, why Muhammad Maulud mentioned this, is that this is now setting the stage so that we do not undermine the sharia. Because we could go through this list of all of the things that are prohibited to say. But if we're undermining each one of, uh, of uh, each one of them, then what's the point? If somebody comes, and here's a hadith. Has anybody heard this hadith that says, there will be people from my ummah who will make halal, silk, and uh, uh, khamar, and alcohol, and music, and all of the, and start, and he listed out, are you familiar with that hadith? Now look at this hadith. The Prophet sallallahu, and this is in Sahih Bukhari, it's a Sahih hadith. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, there will be people from my ummah, Muslims or non-Muslims? They're Muslims. Who make halal, khamar, uh, alcohol. Now if a person actually comes and says, alcohol is halal, are they Muslim? Why? It's daruri knowledge. It's knowledge. I mean, even non-Muslims, like the average non-Muslim, if you say, what do you know about Muslims? What are they going to say? You don't eat pork. You don't drink alcohol. What else? You pray five times a day. That's probably the top three, right? Am I right or wrong? The top three. So even the non-Muslims know that about us. They don't know all of these other details, but it's so common. It's such, a, it's such common knowledge, and it's in the Qur'an, it's in the hadith. Things that are so common about the deen, if we reject them. If somebody says, I'm Muslim, but I don't believe in angels. You've just negated something in the Qur'an. So that negates your Islam. So if somebody comes and they say, alcohol is not haram, they've left Islam because now they're negating a portion of the Qur'an. They're saying, there's parts of the Qur'an that are not true. So why would the Prophet ﷺ say there will be people from my ummah who make these things halal and one of them is khamar? Why do you think that is? The, 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 the hint is what, 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 what muharram are we talking about? What's that? No, that's in the, the ayah. Somebody, if somebody says there's a little bit of good, but there's a lot of harm, and so it's haram. But how can a person call alcohol halal, and he's still a Muslim? Doesn't the rest of the hadith say that they'll call it by something else? They'll call it by something else. Oh, this is not alcohol. This is, you know, what, uh, they'll, they'll call it by, by something else. Maybe they'll just say, oh, I'm not doing something haram. I'm just, uh, I'm trying to fit in with the social network. or You know, they'll do whatever it takes 
to call this alcohol by something else. They'll call it by another name. And so actually by that process of what's called ta'wil, giving this explanation, even a far-fetched explanation, actually keeps people within the boundaries of Islam. Because he's saying, look, the Qur'an says it's haram, I recognize it's haram, but what I'm doing is not haram. I'm just taking a little bit of, uh, uh, I'm just doing some social drinking, or whatever they, they use to, to call it. Um, so, some people say that uh, a little bit doesn't affect me. Mm -hmm. So a little, a little bit doesn't affect me, it's not going to harm me, so, that's, so, so it's okay for me. Right? So they're going, they're, all, they're going through this process. So now with that, we set the stage. What? Sorry, what was that? They are excuses. I mean, it's just like the person who did riba. He says scientific analysis. That's an excuse. Call it what it is. Call a spade a spade. If it's haram, call it haram. If it's, even if we're engaging, if we, if we should be true to ourselves, we say, look, what I'm doing is haram. I know it's haram. I need to change. That's the first step in being able to change. We have to recognize what, that it's haram. In the program that we do in the, in the prison, this is, this is something that we focus a lot on with our students. Because in the process of rehabilitation, they have to recognize that what they're doing is haram. I'll give you an example. One time in one prison, they had to remove all the, the, the Mexican from, from, this, from, from the prison because of a, a, of a gang fight. So when they removed them all, they left all of their lockers and all of their belongings. Well, what did some of the other uh, inmates do? They, the other prisoners started raiding their lockers and taking their things, stealing their stuff, because now they're not there to protect it. Some of the Muslims started going and, um, <clears throat> and being involved in this. And when there's a gang fight and a gang uh, um, um, altercation in the prison, a riot, they call it a war. They'll actually use the term war. Now, for a Muslim, what do we call war? Hmm? Jihad, right? War is jihad. The, uh, one type of war is jihad. So some Muslims, start, and I'm just mentioning that just to kind of show you what they're, the process of thinking. So some Muslims started getting involved in this looting and theft of the property of other people. Somebody said, hey, that's haram what you're doing. He said, no, this is mal ghanima. This is the spoils of war. Now we know the spoils of war are halal, right? This is theft. But for that person to allow himself to engage in the theft, he had to switch it around. He had to say, no, no, this is not theft. I'm not stealing. I'm a Muslim. I don't steal. This is the spoils of war. And he's doing this first Muharram. The ayah that you can use as a reference point for this that's in the Quran is an ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking to the Jews of Medina and by extension also speaking to all of hum humanity. He says, وَلَا تَلْبِسُ الْحَقَّ بِالْبَاطِلِ وَتَكْتُمُ الْحَقُّ وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Do not conceal truth with falsehood and cover up the truth and you know. So why was he speaking to the Jews? What were they covering up? What specific were they? What were the Jews doing in Medina? Why was Beni Israel, who traditionally were in Egypt and in Jerusalem and then over to Babylon and Iraq, what were they doing in the middle of the Arabian Peninsula? They're waiting for the last prophet. Their scriptures knew it. They knew it down to how well did they know the description of the Prophet ﷺ. Like their sons, their children. And when he came and they're like, oh man, he's an Arab. He's from Quraysh. This is not going to work. So what did they start doing? They started gluing the pages of their scriptures together. They started covering it up. They started changing it. So they know the truth. And now they're starting to cover it. So they're not going to say, oh, there's no such thing as the last prophet, the awaited prophet, the prophet we're waiting for. It's just he's not the, the one we're waiting for. So now they're covering up truth with falsehood, with all of these explanations that they give, but they know what the truth is. But it helps them and their communities accept what they're doing. Because if somebody came to them and say, why are you rejecting the last prophet? They're saying, no, 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 we're not rejecting the last prophet. We're still waiting for him. It's just he's not him. Did, did they acknowledge that he's a prophet, but not a prophet from the Jews? I'm not familiar with that, if possibly, yeah. Maybe if you could share me the, the, the resource on that, possibly. But whatever their pro and that's, a, but if they did that, if that's what, one of the things they did, if they said, oh, he's a prophet, but not a prophet for the Jews, that's another explanation. They're just saying, okay, well, he's a, that might be haram, brother, but it's haram for you, it's not haram for me. I know people who have told me when I try to advise them about staying away from things, it's like, 
to know the haram, you have to do the haram. Almost like an usuli principle, right? It's a principle of sharia, like to know the haram, you have to do the haram. And one person said, I want to do the haram so much to where I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> okay, so before I move on to some of the, the, the um, example or, or examples, uh, any questions on that or an application? It's not, it's not necessarily makru, but it's just from the prophetic medicine. Uh, in terms of in, uh, ingesting food, from the prophetic medicine, you should, not in, you should not eat things that your body doesn't like. And one of the hadith of, about this is that the Prophet ﷺ was one time invited to a dinner, and they served lizard. Bub. And Nabil and I, we've been in Mauritania. Remember when they, they tried to get us to eat lizard? Some of the Mauritanians offered us, they offered us lizard, the same lizard that was offered to the Prophet ﷺ in two types. One was a land monitor, one was a water monitor. And then they offered us tortoise one time. And so we're like, man, you know, fresh meat is difficult to come by in the desert, but I can't eat a lizard or a tortoise. And when they offered the tortoise, I said, you know, that thing might have been around when they signed the Declaration of Independence. I'm not eating that animal. Uh, but so... The, the Prophet ﷺ, by him saying, I don't want to eat the lizard, the people thought, oh, is this haram? He said, no, it's just, it's not for my, you know, uh, he's not used to eating something like that. So the lesson is, if your body's telling you not to eat something, you shouldn't eat it. So it's not, it's not makru in the sharia. So if somebody served up some dolphin, I mean, you know, knock yourself out. Yes? Mm hmm It's not what? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, seeking fatwa from the heart, how do you know that it's not waswasa? That's a very good question because a lot, uh, some people do experience waswasa. And the way that I would say, uh, say that is that don't implement this in like you go to one sheikh and then, you, uh, and then you follow your heart. Seek multiple opinions. Especially because fiqh is so diverse, application is so diverse, go to people who are actually authorities in fiqh. Don't just go to anybody, Sheikh Google and Mufti Yahoo and you know. No, go to, go to, go to people who are, who are uh, 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 scholars and verified and seek their fatwas and then see what works for you. I'll give you a, a practical example. This text just came to me yesterday. There was a sister who was divorced. In the Hanafi school, when a person is divorced during the idda for that, that three months, she can't leave the house at all. At all. In the Maliki school, she can leave the house during the daytime. She just has to sleep in the house where she was divorced in. Now, what seems more practical in America for sisters that have uh, jobs and they go to school? I mean, she would have to, you know, somebody might have to take a semester off from school. What could really delay your, your learning? If you're, if you're on a certain track or if you're in a job, man, imagine you're in a job and you're trying to pre provide for yourself. So if somebody goes to the Hanafi Mufti and, and they hear this fatwa, it's not fatwa shopping. This is, we're not talking about fatwa shopping. We're just talking about get multiple valid opinions and then see what works in your life and then follow your heart in that situation. So if I told you right now, and we're not, I'm not necessarily, a lot of the modern fatwas, there's so much diversity, it's, it's, it's going to be difficult to follow your heart. I'm talking about going back to the traditional fatwas. So that these fatwas that Abu Hanifa gave or Imam Malik gave. So if Abu Hanifa is saying three months in the house, stay, no, you know, do not leave. Imam Malik is saying, no, she can leave during the daytime, but can she come back to the house? Now take those two fatwas, and if you see somebody in that situation, present it to them and help guide them to what's going to be best for them. Maybe in the mountains of Mauritania or the mountains of Afghanistan, the, the, the fatwa of Abu Hanifa would be easy to implement because she would have family that could go and buy the things for her, people that would come and visit her in her house. And maybe not necessarily even in the mountains. Maybe there's a small town in wherever, I don't know, Mississippi, where she's got a bunch of family members around and it would make it easier for her to implement that hukum. And she feels more comfortable with that. But from what I see, like in, in Europe, in the West, and in, in, um, uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the U.S., that Maliki hukum makes more, is more applicable in, in our situation. Is that, is that true? So that's, that's the situation where seek fatwa from your heart. 
go to valid scholarships, the traditional fatwas. In terms of the waswasa, we're talking about a person that's not experiencing waswasa. If a person is experiencing waswasa, they, they shouldn't they, uh, um, um, work to implement this. Because if they're experiencing waswasa, there's an imbalance in their judgment. And what I mean by an imbalance is like, if you find somebody that takes an hour to do wudu, is there an imbalance in their judgment? Because they're feeling like, did I wash my hand? Did I wash my hand? Did I wash my hand? Did I wash? There's an imbalance. There's an imbalance there. So that person is not really at a point yet to where they can come back to their baseline and be able to make a, 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 a good choice. It's not to say that they shouldn't do that, but for that person, they should take more precautions. They should involve other people. Maybe explain to the muftis, look, I'm dealing with this waswasa and these are my situations. Uh, talk to a mental health professional, talk to elders, talk to uh, people in their family, get multiple opinions, and then have, maybe have other people help them decide. I don't know if that answers your question, sister, or helps you. In This is a, the question is, can a well, person from one method cross over to another? There's a, there's a difference of opinion amongst, yeah, there's a, there's a difference of opinion amongst the usuli med, uh, scholars that say, if you choose to follow one madhab, do you have to stay within that with all matters? Or can you choose from another madhab? Like, I pray according to the Maliki, I fast according to the Hanafi, and I do my buying and selling according to the Shafi'i. Many scholars have said, have said that's permissible. And that's something that I've seen a number of my shiuch as, as well implement. And, and honestly, after studying the madahib, I don't think anybody can, can implement one madhab 100% unless they live like off in isolation by themselves. If you're going to be in modern society and be in the world, you have, to, you have to be able to have some, at least some degree of flexibility. So we need to maintain adherence as much as possible so that we don't become buffet type uh, fiqh application in our lives, but at the same time realize that there's some, there's some, um, uh, there's some room in the sharia. So, one more question on this topic and then we'll go, yes. Okay, sure. Oh, well I prefer like about like 20 minutes of lecture then some questions and then, so we'll, we'll intersperse it. Okay, all right. So, uh, well, well, let's just take this one last question and then go. Since uh, my question is, um, is somebody making um, some haram, yeah, making the, uh, it's like, like, okay, it, it's okay for him to take it. Like, if you have somebody taking uh, alcohol, saying it is safe, that's why it is um, taking alcohol. Too. Oh, yeah, that's a good, that's a good question, yeah. For alcohol? Yeah. So when I was talking about the use of alcohol, we're talking about recreational use. Recreational use and calling it by other names. We're not talking about medicinal use. Medicinal use, that's a, a fiqh discussion where some of the fuqaha said alcohol can be used medic for medicinal uses. And others like Imam Shafi'i and Imam Malik said no, it cannot be used unless there's like extreme proven benefit. So the, the discussion of use of alcohol and medicine, but those people who are using the alcohol, like if we, if we, take, some, if we take some medicine <clears throat> that's preserved in alcohol, we're not saying this is not alcohol. We're actually saying this is alcohol, but now we're going to use it for medicinal purposes. It's different than if I say, oh, no, 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 this is not, this is not khamar. This is not alcohol. You see, the, you see the difference? So when we're talking about medicinal use, that's not, we're not changing the reality of what it is. This prohibition is talking about changing the, the name to indicate that that thing has a different reality. Oh, like hangover free alcohol? Yeah. I think you'll find it more common where people will, uh, will, you, you will see this prohibition in non-Muslim cultures. Like, for example, in, if we're talking about alcohol, where they'll say, drink responsibly. Um, social drinking. They'll use these, they're not talking, oh, he got liquored up. Bad or good? 
even with the non-Muslims. He got liquored up. That's bad. Oh, he's just social, uh, social drinking. They're using that. For Muslims, though, I don't really see it with alcohol. I see it with marijuana, where Muslims will actually say, oh, marijuana is not an intoxicant. Oh, hold on a second. And they'll start coming with all of these things. I've met a number of Muslims who have justified to me marijuana use. And I'll tell them it's, it's one brother. Uh, uh, I, said, I said, yeah, you know, you know, so-and-so, he's dealing with a drug problem. He, and Because I knew this brother was smoking marijuana. And so I wanted a segue to have a conversation with him. So this other brother who's smoking marijuana, I said, yeah, he's got some issues. He needs to get, seek help. He's, you know, he's addicted to marijuana. He's, he, he's using drugs. He's addicted to marijuana. I threw out that word, marijuana and drugs. He's like, marijuana's not a drug. And a lot of uh, drug users don't consider marijuana to be a drug. And it's, um, it's, it's classified as a drug. Its effects are a drug. It's a gateway drug. But he, these people who are using marijuana, oh, no, no, it's not a drug. It's not a drug. So anyway, let's move on to the, to the next one. I think uh, that's enough uh, of just to get you thinking about this. When you read the news, you'll see this a lot. The guy who just uh, walked into the, uh, the pizzeria in Virginia, right? What did they call him? You know the guy that walked into the pizzeria in uh, Virginia? You didn't hear about that? See, you didn't hear about it. And Nabil's brother-in-law was in that restaurant. That restaurant, it's a ping pong restaurant. He's in there with his family. This guy comes in with an assault rifle. And because there was a fake news story, you know how they do like fake news stories? So they did a fake news story that, that Hillary Clinton was running some like very bad uh, thing, child trafficking type stuff out of that pizza joint. I mean, totally fake news. But this guy comes up and he's going to like investigate himself, walks into the restaurant with an assault rifle, scares everybody. Now he's inflicting terror with a political motive. That's the definition of a terrorist, right? Shooter. He's a shooter because he's white. So the media, if you're Muslim and you do a crime, you're a terrorist. If you're white and you do a crime like that, you're mentally ill and you're a shooter. It's the same exact thing that's happening and they're doing this political doublespeak, the play on words, um, the, um, um, their factory, the, the word spin and so forth. And so it's very powerful in the media. So after that, there's a section you know, on uh, prohibitions as it relates to Aqidah, which uh, we went through, and Dr. Shadi mentioned some of those things that are in there. Um, one thing that I would like to talk about, it's, it's um, the, the idea, this is a very, I wish I had a, a whiteboard, but just try to visualize this. This is a topic that was already covered by Sheikh Salik, but I want to re revisit it because it's very common, it's very, and it's very practical. And one of the things about Sheikh Muhammad Mawlud's books is that the, the rules that he's gathered together are very practical. You can read a more extensive fiqh book, and a lot of those scenarios you're not going to deal with on a daily basis. I guarantee you, you study this book, you'll start seeing things every single day in what other people are saying, in what you might be saying, in what you're reading. It's, it's very practical. So <clears throat> this is the, the triangle of Ghiba, Namima, and Bohatan. Who was in, anybody in Sheikh Sadiq's classes? One. Okay. So, so basically, let's start off with the definition of riba. What is the definition of the of riba? When a person is not present and you talk bad, bad about them. When a person is not present and you talk bad about them. Let's get some more details. The sister in the back. Saying something about the person that they would not want, want said. What else? What else can we give to give a definition? And one of the things about fiqh definitions is that they're very particular. So these are the three things. There's three qualities to make riba riba. The first is it's true. It has to be something about true. If we just criticize and made up something, there's a different name to them. But it's saying something true about a person in their absence. Absence is the second uh, criteria that if they heard, they would not like. True, absence, will hurt them. So those three things. So now, if it's to their face, it's a different, if it's a different name. If it's a lie, it's a different name. If it wouldn't hurt them, it's not riba. So those three qualities are what makes riba riba. So that's riba. That includes a lot of things now. It's mentioning anything. Even if you talked about a person's kufi. Oh, did you see that brother's kufi? Uh, Muhammad Mawlud mentions in there even talking about a person's dog. How many times have you seen somebody walking a dog and you felt like saying something about it? Like, let's be honest. My name is Rami. 
and I felt like criticizing somebody's dog. And not because I don't like dogs. I actually like dogs. And in the Maliki school, there's more room for dogs. It's not Najasa and so forth. But we can't take it unless it's, there's a purpose to it. But how many times have you wanted to criticize somebody's dog or a store's sign or somebody's car? You felt like that. If we said it, that's riba of that person. Because if we pass by a store and we, we say something about that sign, to, and, and also it's to somebody else. It's not like you're driving your car by yourself and you say something. We're talking about you, they have those three criteria and there's a listener. There's somebody that listens. So I guess that's a fourth criteria. Fourth cri we can consider that the fourth criteria. The fourth criteria, there's somebody who heard it. So now there's a lot of things that we can't say, you know, that we have to be careful about saying. So that's the, that's the criteria of riba. The next thing that we have to understand about riba <coughs> is there are times when it's permissible and the majority of times it's haram. So pork, for example, haram or halal, goes without saying, right? When is it halal? When is it even wajib to eat pork? When you're dying. So if there's a clear necessity, you can engage in eating pork. In the same way, if there's a clear necessity, you can engage in riba. And this is, uh, there's a story of when Hind radiallahu anha came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi and she complained about her husband. Does anybody know what she said? He's stingy. Abu Sufyan. Is there any shaykh on the face of this earth, any wali, any peer, who has a station higher than Abu Sufyan? Is there? No. Because Abu Sufyan is a Sahabi. And the lowest of the Sahabi cannot be touched by even the greatest of the, the awliya from the tabi'een. That's the that's a honor that Allah has given them. Here is a Sahabiyah criticizing another Sahabi. So a one lesson that we should remember here is nobody is above criticism. And who many people, just a quick show of hands, how many people have seen that if a valid criticism was uh, directed towards a religious figure or sheikh, they're like, no, no, you need to have adab. Don't talk about the sheikh. Right? As if now they're ma'asum like the prophets and we can't talk about them. Nobody's above criticism. But we have to do it in a proper way. We're not going to make fun of religious figures. We're not going to make fun of anybody. Hind had a valid reason. She was a wife in need of support. Her husband was not giving her her full support. She came to the Prophet ﷺ. She complained and she used the word bakhil to describe him. Now if Abu Sufyan heard her say bakhil, would he have been bothered? But the fact that the Prophet ﷺ listened to her complaint is a proof that it was permissible for her to engage in that at that point. Because one of the things that we know about the Prophet ﷺ is that it is impossible for him to see or hear something that is forbidden and not say something about it. Because one of his sunnas is approval. So if he sees something and he approves it, then that's, we could later say, oh, it's halal. That's why, like in the story of the lizard, when he didn't eat the lizard, the first thought that came to their mind was, oh, it must be haram. And, but he had to explain, no, it's not haram. I'm just not eating it because it doesn't, it doesn't uh, uh, you know, work with, my, with, 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 with what I'm used to in terms of food. So by him listening to it, it shows that it's permissible. So in situ, and then he told her, you can take some of his money, but just take what's your, what's your haq, what's your right. So in the situation of seeking a fatwa, if you have to go and you have to explain to a mufti and say, this is my situation, you may have to reveal things about yourself or about others that normally you should not be doing. Just like when we go to a doctor, we may have to uncover our aura, right? Which normally is not permissible, but we do so for that specific purpose, that specific reason for healing. Same thing when we go to, to uh, a mufti for, for, for an answer. Issues of marriage. If somebody comes and they want to, to get married, this is one scenario where riba not only is permissible, it's actually wajib. You have to seek it and people have to give it. So the idea of husnul dhan, like a good opinion at all times, it doesn't apply here. And just to take a short break, commercial break, a little about husnul dhan. How many of you have ever experienced where you try to give some criticism that you feel is valid criticism and you feel that I do have a, a need and a, a, a purpose for doing this riba, I need to hand out this criticism, and somebody said, sister, brother, have husnul dhan. How many people have experienced that? Just a raise of hand. You've experienced that, right? 
And the reason why is because we're always hearing the hadith, husnul dhan, husnul dhan, husnul dhan, don't have a bad opinion, don't have a bad opinion. How many of us have ever heard, whether on the minbar or in a class or in a book, the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said, اِحْتَرِسُ مِنِ النَّاسِ بِسُوءُ الظَّنِ Guard yourself from people by سُوءُ الظَّنِ By having a bad opinion. Anybody heard that hadith? It balances out. Now, if, you, if I tell you two hadith, without even you having studied this, if I say there's a hadith that tells us as a community that we have to have good opinions of our fellows, and I say there's another hadith that says, have a bad opinion of others. Are these contradicting each other? They, they are. So how do we make... So did the Prophet... Is one wrong and one's correct? How do we join between them? If I give you those two principles, and I say, have a good opinion, have a bad opinion, how are you going to join between them? I would say, like, maybe they, maybe they have, like, a good intention or whatever, but, you know, their action could do something bad, so I've got to be ready for it. Okay, so you, you, you give them both at the same time. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, don't go, to, don't, don't go to extreme to where you love someone so much or you, uh, to, to the other side, you know, you, it helps you keep a balance. But sometimes, like, uh, talking to people, you can, um, by nature, um, understand their um, behavior. So you can figure out whether they are good or bad. By, by having... By observing... Oh, I see. So by observing their behavior, you can figure them out. Right. And if you gave them, if you just automatically gave them benefit of the doubt, you wouldn't do that analysis. Is that what you're trying to say? What I'm trying to say is like oh, we see their actions and uh, their uh, behavior in general mm -hmm. and then figure out uh, which uh, side is more weighty. Which principle to use. Right. That's a good... Those are just two principles to use and God endowed you with an intellect, you don't need a mufti at every single point of your life. There's p p places where you might even be more, um, uh, more observant than a mufti. He might be able to show you what's in the books, but you're like, Sheikh, listen. This guy, one time there was a guy who was, um, he was abusing his wife. And we eventually had to go to his house. We literally took the wife out, and we had a brother standing guard with uh, something just in case. Um, and took her out of the, the area, but before some of the, the dean type figure could tell that this brother was, a, was, was not good, there was somebody in the group who was not learned, but he just looked at the person, he said, he said, he's lying. This brother has abused his wife. He's not claiming that he hit her, but he did it. I can say it about him. So that's why you need the jama'ah. That's why you need a um, a, a group of people so that they can balance because some people are going to be able to say Sheikh, you can tell me what the hukum is but he's lying and so they have that they, they have that uh, uh, intuitive feeling innate you know um, uh, feelings that the, what they have about that so husnul dhan is the general principle generally give people a good opinion but in specific scenarios scenarios give the suul dhan the bad opinion. And Sidi Ahmed Zarruq actually mentions three specifics. He said there's three areas you don't even start off with husnul dhan. Your deen, your family, and your wealth. So what does that mean? When somebody who you don't know stands up to lead the prayer, or somebody who you don't know, like if you don't know me and I'm sitting here, don't give me the benefit of the doubt. Google my name. See if there's anything out there that's... And you should not be... You should not feel like, oh, this is bad to end up with the teacher. Now, Google me. And any sheikh that sits in this position of transmitting the deen, you should feel comfortable in, hey, let me check out what is Facebook. Scroll down his Facebook. Don't think this is spying. That's not spying. Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, one of the greatest scholars of this ummah in the 7th century of Hijri, he said, in the deen, you don't give him the benefit of the doubt. When somebody stands up for prayer, don't think that just because he's the imam, has a beard, has a kufi, has a this, has a that, that automatically, oh, he must be a good person. No. He's given, he, he's, he's guilty until proven innocent. You have to prove yourself for the, for, for the position of the deen. So you don't, you don't have a good opinion uh, uh, on that. You start off with a bad opinion. Of course, it doesn't mean you go like, you know, full-on investigative journalist and, you know, and expose them. We're not talking, we're talking about don't put your deen... Would you put a million dollars in the hands of anybody? So why do we put our deen in the hands of just anybody? 
We have to just go through a process of verifying them. And we're not talking about like do everything background. Well, actually, if you're going to hire an imam, I suggest background checks. There should be background checks for imams. How many messages do background checks on their imams? Very few. Ever, hmm? Very few. I don't think anybody does. No, type in his social security and just do a $25 background check. See what's going on. Call the other messages. See why did he leave that messenger? What, what is going on? There was one imam, he, he had some shady stuff going on in Southern California. Then he went to the other coast. There was one person who went from Chicago to California. And they're doing shady stuff in their places and then they, whew, they, just, they just switch. So don't, uh, when it comes to money, when it comes to your family, if you're going to travel and you're going to let somebody in the community say, hey, look after my brother. Sidi Ahmed Zarruq said, do not trust your family with anybody unless you've tried them alfu, alfu marra. A thousand, thousand times, a million. Like, don't just think, like, if there's going to be, if, you, if you're going to go, say, you need to step out and you see somebody in the community, hey, can you watch my kids for a second? No. No, not even for an instant. You should automatically give su'uvan. You bring somebody into your house, you allow your kids to be watched by somebody, give them su'uvan. Could this person do the worst? Let your brain, like, figure it out, and then, and then it rests later. Okay, he's fine, he checked out. But always be on guard, always be on guard. Okay, so going back to the ghibah. We have the su'uvan principle and the husnuvan principle, and those are going to balance out how we, how we interact with people. But if we have to seek marriage from somebody, to, uh, somebody, then you should automatically give him suit of one, right? If a brother comes to the community and he wants to get married, don't give him a uh, husn of one. Oh, he's a brother, he's looking for marriage in the masjid. You guys know what happened with that FBI plant in Southern California, right? Remember, you heard about that? They planted him in the masjid. Eventually, the masjid called the FBI and said, there's a guy talking crazy at the masjid. And they reported this secret FBI infiltrator to the FBI who placed him in the masjid. Well, one of the things that he wanted to do to, to get more embedded in the community was actually marry a Muslim sister. Now, I'm not saying everybody we should automatically think that they're a plant. Could be, right? Could be. But when somebody comes, there's even other things. Like, one, like we were talking last night about, about somebody who lived a very bad life. I mean, we're talking about everything, drugs, alcohol, gambling, running with women, whatever. And then all of a sudden, he changes his life, and now he comes to the community, and then they're gonna, the family is going to get him married to that sister who preserved her chastity her whole life, has been modest her whole life, and, oh, brother, let's get you married to, you, to this sister. Is, is that fair? That's not fair. That is not fair. So we should not give husn al to anybody that just comes to ask the hand of, you know, of, of our daughter or if our son wants to marry somebody. Like investigative journalism, you call people, you verify check, you do stuff. If somebody, you like, and you give them, don't say, oh, well, you know, if we don't let our mar son marry this girl or, this gir or our daughter marry this guy, that they're never going to get somebody, they're never going to get married because that's su'uban billah. Now we're having a bad opinion of Allah that he's not going to be able to provide a spouse. No, you don't. Don't put this amana. Don't put this trust. Would you put $10 million in the hands of just anybody? Oh, he came to the masjid. He prayed. He had a kufi, a beard, this, that, and the other. He was reading Quran. So I gave him our family wealth of $10 million. Would anybody do that? So why do we put our daughters in the hands of people we don't know? Why do we put our sons into the homes of people we don't know? We should go through that process. So if it comes to marriage, if it comes to business, uh, riba is, is uh, not only is it permissible, it's wajib. If somebody comes and asks you, or if you're the only person who can give this advice, it's an obligation upon you. Uh, so that's riba. I just put out a number of concepts and, and, and principles for, for riba so that we have a well-rounded understanding of riba. This is only part of this triangle. Of This is the majority of interactions between people go between riba, namima, and buhtan. So I want everybody to understand ghibah, the principles of ghibah, when it's permissible, feeling comfortable to engage in it when it's permissible, but not go beyond. This is another thing. There's a hadith, and make a note of this for those of you who are writing. The Prophet ﷺ said, mention the disobedient Muslim. With that which is, about that which is in that person, or about that which is true, to warn people. Now, some people consider this a, a weak hadith, but even if we're if we're going to, to look at the uh, if we're not going to look at the strength of the hadith, the principles are sound. Mention the bad Muslim, that which is true, 
to warn people. These are the three principles that you have when you're going to do riba about another person, about a bad person. So if we're going to talk about this person, just say, somebody comes and says, you know, I'm going to, get in, I'm going to go into business with so-and-so. Okay, well, you should know, you know, he's, he's not very good with money. He's neg negligent. He does some fraud. He's cheated some people. Oh, okay, thank you, brother. And his breath stinks. <laughs> now we went, we went too far. Hadith says, mention the bad person, that which is in him, don't make stuff up, to warn people. Do you really need to warn him about the bad breath? No. His fashion is like, man, and he wears some really wacky clothes. We don't need to do that. There was um, one time I was uh, asked to, to intervene in this family. They said, you know, our daughter is engaged to this person and we need to ask you some advice about him. So they didn't have the, 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 the fiancé or the, the, the guy or the girl there. They just had the family of the girl. And they invited me to, uh, to, to talk and because I knew, the, I knew the guy, they said, you know, we're experiencing this. Could you explain, you know, he's, he's saying it's coming from the dean. We just want to know. So we engaged in a session of riba, right? Were we doing riba? Yeah. At one point, they made a joke. I said, hold on one second. Let's stop. I said, we can do riba of this person because this is an instance where we can do riba because we can talk about him. We know for a fact if he, heard, if he knew we were having this conversation, he would not like it. We're going to have this conversation, but don't make a joke about the brother. That's going too far. So mention things about a people. That is true, but just to warn people. That's the, that's the thing. One time there was a, I was sitting with a sheikh, and somebody mentioned um, a world figure, a leader, a world leader. It was a non-Muslim leader. And he said, he said, oh yeah, yeah, he does this. And this is per a person who's been known to have, have, um, have, have engaged in wars that cost the lives of many, many Muslims. And so he's talking to this Muslim sheikh about, about, uh, to the sheikh about this guy. And then he says, oh yeah, and he looks like such and such animal. He likened him to an animal. And I guess you could see a, resembl a resemblance there. The sheikh stopped and he said, have you made the riba of a kafir halal? And to me, it like it, it like it really hit me. This is here. This is one of the essence of riba. It's like riba is riba. It's not just against Muslims. If you're and that person resided in the country of this leader, so he was he had a citizenship in that country. He had a he had a contract with this with, with these these people. And uh, you have to just like the dhimmi, the non-Muslim who lives in the land of the Muslim, or the Muslim who lives under a contract. With, uh, with the non-Muslims, they are given the same rights. Can we steal from the dhimmi? No. Can we backbite the dhimmi? Can we make fun of the dhimmi? No. He's in fi dhimmatillahi wa rasulihi. Dhimmi does not mean madhmoom. It doesn't mean like abased. Dhimmi means under the protection. And the hadith says under the protection of Allah and His Messenger. His life is protected, his health is protected, his wealth is protected, his dignity and his honor is protected. So we can't make fun of, uh, of other people. So this knocks out a lot of like satire, satire and political comedy and so forth. A lot of that just say we're not going to engage in, uh, engage in that. So that's riba. Everybody understand the concept? I'm going to move to, to Namima and then to Bhutan and then show how this, this works and this happens a lot in our societies and then we can open it up for questions in terms of application. Namima. What is Namima? Going around talking about people. What else can we say? Carrying tales. That's usually how it's translated in English, right? Carrying tales. What else? Gossip. What's that? Making false accusations. This is why technical terminology is very, very, very important. When we see the word namima in the Quran, it's talking about a very specific thing. When Allah talks about riba, I mean, by those definitions that I provided from the hadith and from the understanding of the scholars, that's a very specific definition of what riba is, right? So in English, if we were to say gossip, would gossip pretty much be sound like riba? Would it? It could, right? It could also be namima. If I said carrying tales, and language is very important to understand. So when we translate, we have to understand the implications of, of the words that we use. In English, when we say tales, is it true or false? True. True. Could it be false? Could be false, right? 
tales, tales of the ancient. You know, these are like the the asatir al awwalin. So namima is specifically what namima is carrying the riba to the person who it was said about. We know what riba is. It's carrying that riba to that to the person who was said about. So I use an ABC triangle. So A and B are having a conversation. A is doing riba about C. Draw that on your piece of paper. A, B, C. Mr. A, we could say Mr. T, but we're not going to bring him into this. Mr. We're not going to bring Mr. T into the conversation. Mr. A is talking about Mr. C in the presence of Mr. B. So Mr. A is doing riba. The, the victim of his attack is Mr. C. And Mr. B is the listener. The first haram thing that Mr. B did is by listening. There's a hadith the Prophet ﷺ said that the listener of ghibah is sharik, is the partner of the qa'il, is the partner of the one who said it. So somebody might say, well, I didn't say the ghibah. Yeah, but you listen to it. And you're the partner in this business. If you didn't put your ear there, could ghibah have even taken place? We're not talking about venting your frustrations when you're, when you're on your own. That's a separate discussion. We're going to have separate rules and, and discussion about that. We're talking very specifically about riba, where this person talks about, uh, uh, listens to, to what you're saying. So the first thing that he did that was haram was listening to the haram. So this teaches us what? If you hear riba, you either have to stop it, change the subject, or leave. And that's probably going to be your most difficult one of your most difficult applications of the prohibitions of the tongue from now for the rest of your life. You might be able to stop ghibah in your own life, but you can't stop somebody else. So what happens when you start hearing ghibah with other people? If it's in the public sphere, it's easy. You move to the next train car, you just take, you, 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 you take another seat, you put on your headphones, you do whatever. But what happens when it's your family that's doing it? And if you get up and you walk away, oh, I'll come back, well, why are you leaving? Why are you leaving? That's the biggest fitna that people have when they're trying to implement protecting their ears from listening to ghibah. Like the person that I told you, I said, you know, there's a ghibah. No, no, there's a scientific discussion, scientific analysis. So that's going to be difficult. If you're at your lounge at work, for those of you who work in an in a office type environment, how much ghibah happens at the lounge? For those of you who are at school, how much riba happens at the teacher's lounge? One time I was teaching at a, a K through 8 uh, Islamic school, and the students complained to me. They said, you know, Uncle Rami, the teachers, they talk a lot about us. And it was a small school and mostly moms involved. It was actually, um, and so, um, so I went to the teachers and I said, you know, there's a complaint that the students have that you're talking about them. And it was the first time that they realized that talking about chil children was included in the category of riba. When I talk, I have two ki three kids. My two kids, eight-year-old and four-year-old. Before I mention a story about them, I'll ask them, I'll say, is it okay for me to mention the story? Or if I mention the story about them right now, like in that whole definition of riba, does it mention age? Did we mention faith? No. So even talking about a little kid, it's considered riba. But a lot of people, they just, they, for whatever reason, kids think it's just about kids. And we'll tell the kids, oh, don't backbite the other kids. That's amongst the kids. And for the adults, so one of the assumptions that I've seen is that they just think it's amongst adults. So when I brought it to the attention of the teachers, like you're talking about the kids, and they're like, oh my goodness, we didn't realize that this is ghibah. You're talking, I mean, it might be a valid thing. You might, that, that kid might have cheated on a test. But what is that other, what is a teacher in, for example, kindergarten, why does she have to know about what the eighth grader is doing? If it's not relevant to her, to, to her life, if her input is not needed, it's just chit-chat over a cup of tea or whatever. So they took it seriously. Alhamdulillah, they changed that and they said, we're not going to be talking about, about, about students. And the students re re really appreciated it. Um, and so that's, um, that's, one of the, uh, that's one of the other things that we have to remember, that riba applies at multiple levels. So you have the person who's listening to it. Now, once you listen to it, and we've committed this, this haram of listening to ghibah, the worst haram is taking that ghibah and going back to the person who was said about it and say, do you know what Mr. A said about you? That's namima. And according to the hadith and the understanding of the, uh, of the scholars, namima is worse than ghibah. Namima is worse than ghibah. 
Because what would have happened if they just let that conversation die? That's it. There was one of the early, um, uh, the people of the set of the story, whether it's sound or not, I, 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 like the less, I like the image that was presented to it. Somebody brought riba to somebody. And he said, you know, so-and-so said this about you. And the, Mr. C in this, in this situation said, my brother shot an arrow at me. And he missed me. Right? Because I didn't hear it. You picked that arrow up and you stabbed me with it. So there's a lot of fitna. Families are ruined by this, this deadly triangle. Communities are ruined. Uh, masajid are, are ruined. Nations can be ruined by this little triangle of, of Namima. Now, it doesn't stop there at Mr., uh, at Mr. C. Now, what does Mr. C do when he gets infuriated? Goes back to A. Goes back to A. What did you say about me? And that's called buhtan. There's two types of buhtan. One is where you lie about a person, like when they lied about Aisha radiallahu anha, and Umar said, هَذَا بُهْتَانٌ عَظِيمٌ This is a, a grand buhtan. And the Qur'an actually was revealed in the same, uh, the, the same words that the, the Umar had said, هَذَا بُهْتَانٌ عَظِيمٌ So if we lie, so if we make up a lie, that's called buhtan. But also bringing true things to the person who was said, it to, uh, said to, that's called buhtan. Buhtan means to become astonished. What happens, if you've ever seen this occur, when the ghibah is brought back to the person who said it, and thrown in their face, what does their face look like? Right? I, because they, they weren't expecting that. They weren't planning for this person to hear that. That's why they were doing it in the first place. They were doing the riba. When we look at the description of riba in the Quran, what is it? It's like what? Ayuhibbu ahadukum an? What's that? To eat the flesh of his brother who is dead. Now, aside from it being like, and especially now that all these like zombie stuff, we, we know what eating the flesh of dead looks like, right? It's gross, right? But in addition to the imagery that gives us just to make it seem, like to, to remind us like Riba is a foul, filthy thing, do not engage in it. Why is it a dead brother? Because he cannot defend himself. If you bet you're a live brother, what is he going to do? Hey, get off of me! You're going to fight back. So if you actually have something to say to a person, give that person a fighting chance. Go to them and say, I would like to have a discussion. Let's talk about this, that, and the other. And then a lot of times you might be able to clarify, well, I didn't, this is what happened and this is what I mean. And you could resolve it. But when you talk behind their back, when we talk behind their back, we don't give them a fighting chance. It's like eating the flesh of our dead brother. So then what happens, because we did not give them a fighting chance, and now they want to save their name, save their face, address the issue, now they come back to you, Mr. A, and said, you said this about me, and you said this about me. Now, in terms of conflict resolution, if they come with that attitude, is that going to solve the conflict? No, it's just going to increase it. So one of the rahmas of the sharia is that criminal who, can, who by his act or her act of, of engaging in ghibah, her rights are also, or his rights are protected by telling Mr. C, don't go to Mr. A. Just let it die. Leave it alone. That's the first thing. Don't, don't even carry it back to the person. Now, this is a good ideal. In many situations, we might be able to just say, let's turn it over to Allah. There are situations, though, that we do need to talk about issues. We can't just let them... I mean, how many times have you experienced where maybe you heard something about, said about you, and it ate away at you for years? For years. I'll be the first. I'm going to raise my hand. Hi, my name is Rami. And there's things that have eaten, eaten away from me at years. Anybody else? Maybe I'm just... Raise your hand so I can just get a... Okay, I just want to make sure I'm not alone. Um, so there are things that... Eat, so is it, is it healthy for it to be eating away for us for years? No, it's not. So either we just have to let it go. Any kids here watch Frozen? Did you watch Frozen? You didn't watch Frozen? You can say yes, my daughter watched Frozen. Did, she, did you? Yeah? She actually has a, a, funny, uh, a funny riddle, maybe. How does a frozen blanket keep you warm? Anybody? Sumaya, this is for you if you see this later on. Uh, how does a frozen blanket keep you warm? 
And then she brings out her Disney frozen blanket. <laughs> Here's a frozen blanket. Keeps you warm. Okay, drum rolls, you know. <laughs> Corny joke. Okay, um, so in Fro did you watch Frozen? Are you too embarrassed? Am I embarrassing you? Okay, you don't have to answer. That's fine. Any of the adults watch Frozen? Hi, my name's Rami, and I watch Frozen, you know. Okay, you watch it? Okay. So, Let It Go was the song, right? Oh, you saw it? You saw it on the, the girl back? Okay, you saw it. Okay, so Let It Go. So, she said Let It Go. So, a lot, if we can really, really let it go, then that's the healthy, that, that, that could be a healthy thing. And I'm going to tie in another muharram. I'm, I'm kind of... I'm not going in a linear fashion because honestly, if you, want to, if you want to seek this text, and I advise you to do that, to go through it in a linear fashion, I have 12 hours of lectures on it through Seekers Hub. You can listen to the whole thing. I'm giving you like a holistic tying in a lot of the different ideas. So one of the ideas that he mentions in here is a hadith about Abu Dumdum. Sounds pretty cool. The kids probably like that. Abu Dumdum. Sounds like a cool name, right? What's your name? Huh? I can't hear her. Baraka. Oh, Baraka. Okay, Baraka. And what's the, what's the little girl in the back? What's your name? Zahra. Zahra? Zahra, mashallah. Baraka and Zahra. Beautiful names. Okay, so um, if... Um, what was I talking about? Um, Abu Dumdum. Hey, Zahra, does Abu Dumdum sound like a cool name? Dumdum. Sounds like a cool name, right? It's in a hadith. Anybody ever heard of the story of Abu Dumdum? The Prophet ﷺ said, Can any of you, or actually more, Why can't? Uh, are, are you incapacitated? Are you unable to be like Abu Dumdum? He was a man of, from Jahiliya, pre-Islam. He wasn't in the, the, the time. I, actually, did he become a Sahabi? I don't know. But he, during Jahiliya, he had a practice, a morning wird that he would do. He would leave his house, and he would say, Allahumma inni tasaddaqtu bi irdi ala nas. Oh Allah, I have given my honor, my dignity uh, as a sadaqah to the people. Which means anybody who has done ghibah to him, he forgives them. Anybody who has done namima about them, I forgive them. Now that might sound like a simple process, but any of you who have heard, especially if it was foul ghibah done about you, or just like basis ghibah, it's hard to give it up, isn't it? It's hard for us to give it up. Abu Dumdum used to do it every single morning. And the Prophet ﷺ said, why can't you be like Abu Dumdum? And just give it up. Give it up for the sake of Allah. Because even though you're giving, I mean this is now my tafsir of it, even though you're giving this up for Allah, and just saying, I don't want to see that person on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. I don't want to see that person on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. I have a friend who, uh, remember Abdul Rahim? I don't know if he ever told you this story. You know Abdul Rahim, uh, Dr. Shadi, yeah. So he, he was, when we were studying in Mauritania, one of the things that we found in Mauritania, and most Muslim countries you'll find this, people, if they see somebody who's a sheikh figure or a sister practicing the deen or studying the deen or somebody who's clearly like they're a talib al-ilm, they're a seeker of knowledge, they're either not going to have any reaction to you, which is the majority of the case, or some people are going to be, MashaAllah, you're a student, a seeker of knowledge, make dua for me. Or they're going to make fun of you, like on the bell curve. The majority of people, you pass them in the street, they're not going to say anything. You have a certain sector of society that are going to show your lo their love to you. Like, uh, Shadi, did you study in Egypt? Yeah. Or in Yemen? Did you find Yemenis in Yemen that would say, MashaAllah, you're a talib al-ilm, barakallahu feek, right? Did you also feel some people were just like looking at you like with a, uh, like a... From Egypt, okay. Okay. So now you're hating on your own people, huh? <laughs> okay. So you get those two people in society. Um, so this brother walked into a, a store and it was two seekers of knowledge from out in the mountains. And when we would come from up in the mountains and down the city, it's like those Wild West movies, you know, where like it comes in and wow, 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 you're all dusty and everything, right? I mean, we haven't washed our clothes in a couple of weeks. You know, we take showers maybe once or twice, you know, a couple times a month, literally. So we're pretty rough looking. And, you know, we've been out there in the elements. So they're seekers of knowledge. They've been in the elements. They walk into a store, and this guy's like smoking a cigarette, and he starts mocking them. And so this brother, he just turns to him, and he says, hey, all he sees, all, this is all he said to him, Araka yawm al-qiyamah. I'll see you on the day of judgment. 
Now you say that to somebody in New Jersey, I'll see you on the day of judgment. What are they just like on the, you know, on the train? They're going to probably pull out their phone like, hey man, say that again, you know, like. But for a person, for a believer, you say that to him, even if he's in a state of like, you know, there he is smoking a cigarette, making fun, not only of another Muslim, but of a seeker of knowledge. His like cigarette dropped and the realization hit him. And he's like, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I'm so sorry. Like he made Toba at that moment. The brother actually later on, he said, I regretted using. That's like, you know, DEFCON 5. You know, that's using like the, the coming out with the big guns on a Muslim. But sometimes maybe you have to use that. Um, so um, you will have, um, now how was I talking, tying this into uh, Abu Dumdum? Okay, so Abu Dumdum, oh, okay, you, if, if somebody uh, takes something from you, takes part of your honor, mocks you, laughs at you, uh, t uh, spreads lies about you, uh, uh, does ghibah about you, you could face them directly or you could just let it go. If you're not able to face it at that time, lingering on it for years, like if that brother didn't deal with that situation at that time, and he lingered, he could be still to this day just, man, should have said something. And that brother, da -da 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 -da. but if he feels like, you know what, I'm going to hang on to this, and I will see him on Yom al Qiyamah. Will he see him on Yom al Qiyamah? Right? Everybody who took your haq, you're going to see him on Yom al Qiyamah. So that's one of the reasons why the people who are close to Allah, they want to clear up everything before they get out of here. And I'll give you an example. Remember this story. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. One day he went to the masjid. He's wearing a kufi. In the hadith it's called qulun suwa. And somebody stole his kufi. His qulun suwa. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz ran after the thief and said, Ya fulan, inni wahabtu halaka. Qul qabiltu. Oh, so and so. I, it's a gift. Just say I accept it. Now why does he need the person to say, Okay, I accept it. Why does he need him to do that? So that's, uh, it's not theft. It's not theft, and he changes the intention. Because even if Umar ibn Abdul Aziz told the person, take it and go, if he didn't hear it, he's still wearing a stolen kufi. But by him realizing, oh, it's a gift? Okay, I accept. Now Umar ibn Abdul Aziz will not see that person on Yom al Qiyamah. So he's that, much con he's that concerned about his people. So if, and, and we, when we read uh, Surah Yasin, Right? The man came from the, other, uh, from the end of the city and he told the people, المرسلين, follow the Mursaleens. What did they do to him? They killed him. They beat him to death. And he was entered into Jannah. What did he say though? Right? Oh, I wish my people would have just known how Allah has forgiven me. So for, the, for that station of the awliya, even the people who have oppressed them, they want for their oppressors the same thing that they got. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz wanted Jannah and no hisab on Yom al-Qiyamah for himself. He wants that other person, hey, I don't want you to be facing me on Yom al-Qiyamah. So if we can get to that stage, and, we can, and it's a high stage, it's not easy, it's not easy, and we can just let things go and forgive people in this dun dunya, you'll clear up their station in, uh, in, in the akhirah, You'll get reward for doing that, and you'll also just clear your heart. So you're giving them a benefit, and you're getting reward, and you're clearing your heart. A modern understanding of this is that when we get stressed out, think about that time where somebody talked about you, or you heard about that. That moment of stress, your body's actually getting stressed out and releasing cortisol and these other stress hormones that gives you the stress. It's the same thing on a lower dose that when you hear a baby crying. You know that feeling when you like hear a baby crying? Your body's actually getting you stressed. So you can't stay, like when you pick up your glass of tea and, and for parents, you know this feeling like when you settled all the kids in and everybody's settled and everybody's asleep and you just sit down, you're like, ah, finally a moment. How many times have you hit that like finally a moment and wham, wham, right? It's almost like they know like on the ghaib, they're like, all right, she's about to sit down and hit it, ah, right? So you can enjoy your cup of tea or your coffee or whatever it is or your book or your, you know, whatever it is that you're going to do while the kids are screaming. Why? And the evolutionists will say is because, oh yeah, our bodies have developed this cortisol result, you know, response and so forth. We'll say Allah put it in there to make us get up and deal with the children, settle them down, and now our body can go back to a resting state. But there is stress hormones that are released to get us to get up. 
Because when a baby's crying, what's your, 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 your reaction? I need to put that, I need to get that, you know, child some food or the baby, whatever, or do whatever. So when we feel the stress hormone or stress, uh, yeah, the stress hormones and the cortisol, we feel it initially when we got harmed by that person. And this is medically proven. Every time we reflect on that, we have a similar stress response. So that stress that we put our body through, you know that feeling and the emotional stress and the emotional exhaustion that you went through going through that stressful situation? Maybe it wasn't riba, maybe it was a conflict, whatever it was. Your body was taxed, right? Now every time you sit there and you just start thinking about it, your body's releasing a similar uh, uh, a response. So what are you doing? You're constantly taxing the system, taxing the system, taxing the system. So when you do what Abu Dumdum did, and you really let it go, you're not just benefiting that person, you're benefiting yourself. But it's not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to do. So it's easier said than done. But if we take it as a practice and just say, you know, I let it go. And every time that thumb comes back, just listen, just like if I say this is water and the hadith says the best thing to give in sadaqah is water. I go and I give somebody sadaqah. If I come back and I say, hey, give me my sadaqah back, what does the hadith describe that as? Not the spit, it's even grosser, it's grosser than the vomit. Licking up your own vomit. Taking a sadaqah back is like licking up your own vomit. So that's a pretty nasty like, image, right? So generally, we know as Muslims, we don't take our sadaqah back. So if you do what Abu Dumdum did, and you give it up for the sake of Allah as a sadaqah to the people, just say, you know what, that person wronged me, that person harmed me, he said something about me, I'm going to give it up for the sake of Allah. Every time your nafs tries to hang on to that, and it'll do it, right? Your nafs wants to hang on to those things. Just say, no, 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 no. I gave that as sadaqah to that person. You want to write it down in a journal? You want to do something? I gave it as sadaqah to the people. I'm not going back to that. That's one way to do it. There are times where we need to address it. So now here, now going back to the, the, the triangle, right? We have the ghibah, Mr. A. We have the, 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 the listener of the ghibah and what he did. Namima. And then Namima when he went to Mr. C. Now Mr. C should have done what Abu Dumdum did and actually done six other things too. There's six things that are mentioned when the person brings you Namima. So before he even goes through the Abu Dumdum process, he should go through the process of the first thing is do not believe this person. Don't believe him. Forbid them from what they are doing. Let me get the whole thing. Hate this action, right? The person, when they're bringing you Namima, don't say, Oh, brother, oh, sister, thank you, man. Thank you, sister. No. The Qur'an says, Hamazim masha'im bin amim. The Qur'an does not talk in a praiseworthy way about the person who carries namima. So when this person brings you namima, say, you're not doing me a favor, you're doing something haram, and I hate this action. So don't believe the person, forbid the person, hate the, 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 this action, um, and don't have a bad opinion of that other person. Like, don't, don't jump to su'uvan. But remember the balance that I talked about, su'uvan and husnuvan. You also use that mechanism to, 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 to judge. Don't look into the matter. Oh, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to look and I'm going to see this. Don't look into it. And don't allow yourself to be pleased with this namima. Don't say, oh, wow, this is, this is a blessing from Allah. It just landed right here in my life. Don't, don't you know, do, go through this process with, 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 with the namima. So you do that to the person. I'm not going to believe you. I'm not going to look into this. Let's stop it. That arrow that you just stabbed me with, you know, let's break it and let's, let's move on. I'm going to do what Abu Dumdum did. I'm not going to go back to that person. What would happen in our societies, in our families, in our marriages, in our massages, in our communities, if Mr. C stopped that, that chain? Kills it, right? Because then it becomes a vicious triangle. This deadly triangle becomes a vicious triangle. Because now when Mr. C goes back to Mr. A, now Mr. A is going to go do riba about Mr. B and Mr. C, and now and then now you get you get it, it spiral. You get multiple triangles, and now this starts going 
I mean, am I exaggerating or is this how it goes? Then it just starts like a virus. It starts multiplying and then now you have all of these triangles and then you have triangles of triangles and then all of the things and then all of a sudden you're fighting a jahili war and you didn't realize it's just because somebody shot your camel. And that's what happened in one of the hundred year jahili wars. It started over somebody's life starting. Shot a camel. Oh, really? You shot my camel? I shoot 10 of your camels. Oh, you shot 10 of my camels? I'm going to kill one of your people. Oh, you kill one of my people? Now I'm going to kill 10 of your people. And this war went on for a hundred years until people are like, what are we fighting about? Right? It spirals out of control. There's some people who said, a lot of our students used to be Crips and Bloods from the gangs of LA and other places. So over the years, I've become familiar with some of the dynamics of, and I, I tried, I heard this story and I verified it with one of, with a, with a, gang, a former gang member from LA. I said, is it true that the whole Crips and gangs things that is now spiraled way out of control. It's all over the US. It's spilled into other countries. It's down into South America. It's become, the Crips have become militarized in the MS-13, the gangs and all these tattoos. Have you ever seen those people that are like fully tattooed in like El Salvador? That's a spinoff of, of, of the, the LA Crips and the gangs. It started over a pair of shoes. A pair of shoes. And that's how the jahiliya like, like spread. So this, this deadly triangle that can turn into a vicious triangle, if at each point just somebody just stopped, the, the, the person who did the ghiba, just don't start it. The person, the listener, just stop it. Don't carry it. If it's carried to you, stop it. Somebody has to be the better person and stop that triangle before it, 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 it blows up. Now, I'll end on this because, and then I'll open it up for, for, for discussion. Um, I think there's a lot of other topics that are mentioned in the Maharam al-Lisan and they're very important. But to me, the heart of the Maharam al-Lisan is that triangle that I that just mentioned with all of those branches for you to understand it. After teaching this many years, that's what I feel because that's what's applied in a number of situations. Recently, I personally was involved in a situation where this triangle began to happen. And the beautiful thing about the Maharam al-Lisan is it's as if Muhammad Mawlud is there telling you, look, you studied this. Here's, and, and, and having names to all of these things. So as I'm watching this unfold, I'm saying, okay, that person did Ghiwa, that person did Namima, that person is trying to do Buhtan, that person is doing this, and now this person is doing, wants to go buh, do Buhtan, you know, because then Buhtan might actually, um, uh, Mr. A, then he's going to go do Buhtan to, like, when Mr. A did Ghiba about C, and then B carried it over to C. Now C is doing Buhtan to Mr. A. When Mr. A hears it, what is he going to do? He's going to go to Mr. B. And so now he's going to do Bhutan to Mr. B. And now what is Mr. B going to do? He's going to go back to Mr. C. And so it just keeps... So I, I started watching this unfold, and I was, and I was in a dilemma. And, and I was actually like now taking... This is why I'm saying you're going to study this book, and for the rest of your life, you're going to be working on application. And you cannot think that you're going to be able to go back to the sheikh or your teacher or whoever helped you understand this and have every situation answered for you. You're going to get to a point where you know the rules. They're pretty basic, right? Is this extensive fiqh? Is this complicated fiqh, inheritance law? This is pretty, this is rules that like, you, you're familiar with a lot of the concepts. Now we just gave you some principles to tie in and terminology. The, the principles are very easy. The difficult part is now application out there in the real life. And that's going to be on your, your own personal judgment. And this is now where you individually become mujtahids. Not a mujtahid who's going to look at the Qur'an and say, this is halal, this is haram, but a mujtahid of application. And so I'll give you this, this, this example. If I taught you the rules of finding the qibla, and the obligation of finding the qibla, when you go out there and you're traveling, or you're in an airport, do you need a sheikh to tell you where the qibla is? What do you do? You just try to find the qibla, right? Using the principles that you know. Qibla is Mecca, this is where we are, whatever, whatever tools that you're going to use, you're going to try to now take that knowledge that the big mujtahids have said Qibla is wajib and this is the proof and all of this. And Imam Malik and Abu Hanifa and Imam Shafi and Ahmed ibn Hamza have passed down to us. Now you have the rule. You're not making up new rules. Now you're just applying that rule to your situation. Does that, is that, uh, do you see that concept? So in the same way you take this triangle and all of those uh, principles that are around there, and you apply it to your life. And don't think somebody's going to help you figure it out. So when I was in this situation, actually just recently, now I'm going through that triangle. I'm going to say, okay, 
Now I'm in that situation. I am now I am in, in, in that triangle. I've been thrust into that triangle. And people are saying things, and what am I going to do? Am I just going to leave it? And am I going to take the Abu Dumdum route? Or am I going to address it, but not address it in the Buhtan method, but actually in conflict resolution? Because there are going to be times in our life where we do have to go back to the people that said things about us, but we do so in a way that I'm not trying to be confrontational, I'm not trying to, you know, um, 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 uh, cause uh, more fitna, let's try to work this out. So I made a, a decision because there's another principle, if I were to ask you, which is better, to forgive or to seek your right? Forgive. To forgive, right? And there's, um, there's an ayah in the Quran that, sa that says this, right? If you forgive, it's better for you. So for the majority of people, even myself for a long time, I thought, okay, that's the general principle. Well, in this book, in the Maharam al-Nisan, where it talks about people who are um, about that principle, it's saying that principle of forgiving is better than seeking your right is for the person that is not doing that thing habitually. They're not doing it habitually. So if somebody is not known to do ghiba, and just, they do ghiba of you, should you forgive them? But what if that person is now there doing ghibah to everybody in the community and they're just causing a lot of fitna? If everybody takes the position of, oh, forgive the brother, forgive the brother, forgive the brother, forgive the brother, what is it going to do to that person? He's, uh, he's going to get worse. He is going to get worse. And what do they call that? If I can, counseling terminology. Or, um, yeah, in counseling, what do they call that? If we as a community don't address this issue, and then we constant we just create a space where they are allowed to continue in their detrimental behavior. What do they call it? What are we doing? Ignoring the We're ignoring it. There's another specific enabling. enabling. We're enabling the person. So if we as a community say, "Oh, forgive and forget, forgive and forget, forgive and forget," that person who has a sickness in their heart is that beneficial to them to take that road? No. no. For that person, we need to stand up to the person and say, "Hey." We need to get, I, I want my haq, and we need to talk about this, and we need to address it. So that person learns, oh, I can't, I can't be doing this. So Imam al-Qurtubi, one of the sultans of tafsir, he said the tafsir of this ayah, don't think this is an absolute principle. Forgiving is better than seeking your right. He said this is for the person that's not doing something habitually. Or for the person that you know won't go back to this. But if you know that by forgiving the person, they're just going to keep going back to him. He didn't use the word enabling, but that's the principle. He says, seek your right. Because for that person, when we start, when we stand up and we seek our right, seek your right, it's going to stop them. Now, in a lot of, um, there's a lot of discussion about bullies, right? If somebody just makes an off-the-cuff remark, you know, he's having a bad day and he says something to you at work or to you at school, right? Once in a while. Oh, I'm sorry, you know, I, I, for, forgive me for saying that. I didn't mean it. Oh, I forgive you, it's okay. Now we go on with our relation. But if he's doing it all the time, that's a bully. And what do bullies need to be, uh, how do you handle a bully? You stand, uh, you stand up to him. And you show him like, I can't, I mean, there's multiple ways now. That, Alhamdulillah, there's a lot of attention and it's even happening in uh, uh, Muslim communities because Muslim communities aren't, aren't uh, uh, free from, from bullies. It's a human condition. So there's multiple ways of dealing with bullies. One of the things like with the Islamophobia, I saw a video where they advise on how to, how to if somebody is making Islamophobic remarks to a person and you see this going on, and they were giving this as an instructional video to the general community, they said, don't go and confront the bully. Just talk to the person and just change the subject. Totally ignore the person. So in some scenarios, because you also don't want to escalate a situation. You don't want to, somebody's, you know, making fun of a sister in hijab, then you should just go and say, Assalamu alaikum sister, how are you doing? You know, how are things are doing? You know, if you just, if you just ignore that person, he might walk away. If you come up, especially as a man, you say, you need to get out of the sister's face. Well, who's going to make me? I'm going to make you, and then what's going to happen? Right? Now, in certain situations, I'm not averse to that. If that, if it comes down to that, we might have to do that. Malcolm X said what? He said, we are Muslims, we are a peaceful people, we obey the law, we respect everybody, but if someone lays their hand on you, put them on a vacation somewhere. He said, send them to the cemetery. I'm not advocating for violence, and I'm not advocating for people to kill, and to, you know, to, 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 to go to the opposite extreme. 
It was metaphorical for those of you listening. Uh, but it just means that we stand up for our rights. Doesn't mean that we send them. Maybe we just take them on ziyara of qubur or something. Maybe that's what he means, right? Let's do tafsir like, come on, brother, let's go visit the dead people, you know, and maybe you'll get some wild and think about the, the qubur. So, yeah, that's what he meant. Send them to the cemetery. <clears throat> so, um, um, you have to stand up to the, the, the people. So, I'm in this situation now, thinking about the deadly triangle, the vicious triangle, thinking about this principle of Imam al-Qurtubi, and I said, you know, Two things are going to happen. <clears throat> if I don't get involved <clears throat> and talk to some of these people involved, it's going to, they're going to, they're going to keep on doing it. This is, this is um, systemic. It's not, a, it's not a one-off situation. This is something that's happening. It's been happening for years and years and years. I happen to be, you know, I stepped into the wrong place at the wrong time. I'm now involved in this situation. If I just step out and say, oh yeah, you know, I'm not going to, it's going to keep on going. The other thing is that I don't think I was ready to do the Abu Dumdum method and it was going to keep eating me up and so i said i'm going to need to talk to this person and so i talked and i just i just flowered it up i don't mean to offense i'm just trying to have a conversation i just want to address some of these issues so that that person knows that i'm not trying to do that buhtan of like what did you say about me and what did you do about this and so forth so we resolved the issue and at the end hope you're not offended no i'm not offended and then afterwards i came out and i was like i actually feel closer to this person I actually feel like our relationship was stronger, like we can actually talk about this without it, without the triangle spiraling out of control. So there are situations where we're going to have to talk. There are situations where we forgive and forget. There are situations where we just totally ignore it. But you're going to have to make that ijtihad on when to do it. On your own personal um, analysis, you might have to talk to other people. You might have to get professional help of a therapist or a counselor, maybe just a, a wise elder in the community or a wise young person in the community or a sheikh or whoever it might be to help you resolve that. So um, I hope, I know we've been sitting for, for over an hour. Um, I'll end with, a f what, what time is Asr? Asr is at uh, 3.15. 3.15. So let's give it um, like a, a few minutes for questions about this. We'll take like a fi five minute stand up break and then we'll come and uh, visit some more topics from this text. Um, and then uh, we'll break for Asad at 3.15. So any questions about this vicious triangle? So if your situation would have gone the other way instead of uh, uh, reconciliation, more aggravation and more fitna, then uh, what would happen? What would have been the situation? Yeah. Well, using the, the model of the Qibla, if I did my ijtihad, and say I walked in and I said, you know, using all of, you know, I looked at the sun, looked at the, the moon, if it was nighttime stars, looked at my qibla, looked at the buildings, looked at the map. And I made my ijtihad and I said, this is the, the, the qibla. And I made my salah. Is my salah sound? Yeah. What if in reality, that's not the qibla? Is my prayer sound? Yeah. It's still sound. Because I'm taken to account for my ijtihad. So if I went into that situation, I spent days reflecting this. It's almost like, you know, it's like social chess. And in fact, as, it, as the situation was moving along, I was like, all right, you know, pawn is moving this. Because you don't know what's going to happen. On it. It's even more, there's so many more variables than chess. At least, you know, those chess masters, they look at it. You know, one person moves one move and he's like, oh, I figured out the whole game. You know, there, there's, a, there's a limited amount. There's like something like, what, 10,000 moves or something? I don't know what it is. I'm, I'm speaking beyond my capacity right now, but it's a limited amount of, 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 of scenarios that can occur. When you're talking about human interactions, whew, that's a total different ball game, ball game. So I reflected on it. I thought about it. I, I thought about what to do. I made my ijtihad and I also had an exit plan that, okay, I'm going to now watch this interaction. If this starts going like the, the wrong way, I'm going to turn around and face the qibla. Because I realized, oh, that's not the qibla. And so I was ready to, to move out of the situation. The problem is when people go into those situations, maybe with a personal vendetta, or I just need to prove my point, um, that's when going into that situation could actually become more harmful. Because then more things are said, and more things are, you know, and, and, and jahiliya starts. Like, like that, oh, you shot my camel, I'll kill your people. And, the, and that's what happens. So before you go into that conflict resolution, you have to do a lot of crushing of the nefs and saying, is this really fi sabilillah? Do I really love this person as a human being? Do I really want to get closer to Allah through this interaction? Am I going through this ibadah? Just like we're getting prepared for the prayer, we'll do and find the qibla, do all of this. You have to do that before you go into the conflict resolution. Otherwise, 
It could get bad. If it does start getting bad, then you've got to get out of that situation and just say, okay, I'm now leaving it up to Allah. I realize Allah is in control of everything, and I'm incapacitated, and I'm just going to go on with my life. Oh yeah, it doesn't have to be verbal. Ghiba, and this is another thing. Ghiba, good question. Ghiba doesn't have to be with just the tongue. You can text, you can email, you can do videos. Um, you can even like, like imagine, I mean, everybody can see me, right? So we're sitting here, say there's a person over here and I'm like. <laughs> and he looks so, I don't have to say anything. And he looks over, he's like, you know. He gets the point. Is that Ghiba? Yeah. It has a different name. It's called Hems and Lems. The Quran says, Hemmazin Mashaim bin Amin. The Hems and the Lems, according there's a hadith that talks about Hems and Lems. Hems is like, it's, it's nudging and winking. Like. So you, don't, you can text, you can nudge, and you can uh, uh, wink. Uh, it's, it's all considered riba. It's pointing out the faults, uh, or, or pointing out something about another person that if they knew you were acknowledging that or talking about it, that they would be uh, upset. Any other questions? That's a very good question. The question was, sometimes when women sit together, they, they talk about issues, in-laws, marriages, so, spouses, so forth, um, and they use the, the rationalization that I'm just seeking advice. Remember the first principle that I mentioned from the book, calling something bad by another name? So if it is pure riba, and we're just calling it seeking advice, now we're playing that little mind game on ourselves, where we're rationalizing this so we can resolve our cognitive dissonance, the problems that we don't want to say this is riba. There are times, there's no doubt, you know, we don't have to just go to a marriage, prof uh, marriage and family therapist, an MFT, a professional. We don't have to just go to a sheikh. We can go to our good friend and say, look, this is the situation that I'm dealing with. Help me make my ijtihad on what to do in this situation, right? And this, uh, um, uh, uh, the Prophet sallallahu said, ad-deenu nasiha. This deen is giving good advice. And one of the blessings that we have as the ummah is we have each other. We can go to each other. I mean, what, we would be, one, of the, one of the wise people in Mauritania said, human beings need other human beings so much so that even when we die, we take people to the cemetery. And I thought to myself, hmm, I never thought, like, why do, we, why do human beings bury in, uh, you know, everybody together? It's like even in death, we need other people. So we need each other. We can give advice to each other. Are there situations where your sister in Islam, your brother in Islam, maybe even a non-Muslim, uh, your brother in humanity, your sister in humanity, might be able to offer you advice on your situation? Yes. But if it's just, okay, let's have the tea, let's have the cookies, and let's start talking. That's not the situation. It should be, it, it, think about it like, if you were about to go into on a very serious business endeavor, couple million dollars involved, would you talk about it with everybody at that tea party? Honestly, no. You're just going to talk about just, you're going to pull those people aside and you're going to say, look, this is the situation, this is the business, da 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 da. So if we're sincere with ourselves and we do want to seek advice from other people, then let's, we're not going to make it over, you know, you can have a cup of tea, have a cup of coffee, but it's not going to be those regular meetings. These are, these are consultations that we might seek from other people at very specific times. What that looks like, what is said, who do you go to, that's going to be your had and you're going to be responsible for answering to Allah on the Day of Judgment, we all are, on whether or not we did, our, uh, we did something with sincerity and we were trying to do that, or we were just wanting to engage in riba, but we called it constructive criticism or scientific evaluation or seeking advice of others. Does that answer your question? Um, so whether it's a group of sisters, whether it's a group of men, whether it's family members, regardless of the situation, you have to say like, Am I really doing this for sincere consultation? Or am I just doing this to uh, pass the time? And there's a hadith that talks about um, the, the ghiba of, the, of the, the, the disobedient Muslim, the fasiq, to not do it out of tafakkuh. 
which is like eating fruits, right? Let's just get, let's just hear, let's talk about those bad Muslims. You can't do that. There's like, there's no point. If there's a specific bad Muslim doing a specific bad thing that re relates to our life, then let's address it. Or a non-Muslim for that, or a bad human being. Any other questions? Yes. Venting is riba. Venting is riba. And, I, and that question comes up all the time. And I know, I know it feels good to vent, even if you're in your car alone. And sometimes you just need to like, let it out and just talk about it. Uh, but the same thing happens if, if, um, if, if, you, if you have a situation and you need to resolve it, you can talk with the, the people that are involved. You know, so, so sometimes if, if, if a couple, if there's a, uh, uh, two people are married and they need to, you know, they, they, they confide in their spouse a lot and they're like, look, I'm dealing with this at work and this is what I need to do or with another coworker. Um, just use those principles. Venting, talking about another person, would that other person be bothered? Most probably the yes. So now it's in the category of riba. When is riba permissible and who can I talk to? So go through that process. So the end result might be, you, it looks like you're venting with your coworkers over a cup of coffee in the lounge, but you're only doing that because you're actually trying to seek sincere advice from this person and you're not doing it as a habit. And one of the things that I feel that you would, uh, you would be able to know the difference between just venting or it's actually constru it's, it's, um, constructive is that is it happening on a regular consistent basis? If it's happening like every day with the coworkers or on a regular basis, this is not consultation. Con uh, consultants aren't supposed, if, they're, if they're, all, they're all the time, they should be an employee of the company, right? So the same thing with the, the, the riba process. If you're going to a person on a consistent process, basis, like this is no longer consultation, this is not nasiha, this is, this is you're just, there, there's something else that's going on. Um, uh, my brother is a, is, a, is a manager at a company and he tells his employees, he said, um, uh, he says, look, I know when I leave, you're going to talk about me. I know that for a fact. Keep it to a minimum and keep it constructive. So that's what I like the venting. Keep it to a minimum and keep it constructive. What about the professional uh, like industry calls? People were all doctors, people were lawyers. And uh, for them, it means talking about how people are applying their trades. Yep. So Is a need. That's how you develop the trade. So amongst the doctors, they might be able to talk about a person because they need to know who's doing what and what procedures and what ethics and who's getting close to, 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 get, uh, to um, transgressing the ethical boundaries, the legal boundaries of that profession. They need to know because as another doctor, if a patient comes and says, should I go see Dr. So-and-so? He shouldn't be like, oh yeah, he's a medical doctor, he's trained, go ahead and see him. No, he needs to be, he needs to be aware. So I see that, I consider that as, a, as, as one of those scenarios where yes, even though there might not be a specific issue involved, just keeping up to date with who's doing what. Now, should that doctor go home and say, hey honey, or so and so, you know, no, that's, no, that's going, to, going too far. Uh, amongst dis dentists, amongst lawyers, hey, amongst shiuch, Figures and I tell people I'm not a sh I'm not a sheikh. Nabil and I studied in Mauritania. We've seen real scholars. When people tell me like, "Oh, sheikh," I'm like, "Look, you know, I'm just a pale imitation of you know maybe a, a, a something not even close." You want to see real shiuch? There are real shiuch in this dunya who have really studied this deen and practiced this deen, and it's not you know like uh, I call it like a, like latte Islam where I just sit back here you know drink a latte and teach the books. I'm talking. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a real sheikh. I've seen real shiuch. But I'm in the profession of the sheikh. I'm in the sheikh business. And I sometimes tell people, I, I used to, there's a lot of things I wanted to do growing up. I wanna, one thing that I would love to do is be like a, a, a park ranger. But not the park ranger that gives you the ticket when you enter the park. I'm talking about the park ranger who's, he's way, and he's, he's backpacked in, he's got a little cabin. I'm like, I'm, so I tell my wife sometimes, I say, you know, if this sheikh business doesn't work out for me, you know, you can see me in Yellowstone. I'm going to be out there in the, the, the woods, mountain man. Uh, but I'm doing my khidmah, you know, uh, for, 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 there's more ejr in being with the jama'ah and being in, in, in the congregation. So, but the reality is, I'm in the sheikh business, right? 
I, could, I, don't, I can't kid myself. I'm in the sheikh business. I give talks. I'm giving a talk here. I do khutbahs. I, I'm in the sheikh business. Dr. Shadi is as well. When we get together as professionals, we know what's going on. And we talk about people. And it's not just like, hey, did you hear about sheikh so-and-so? No. And we're not mentioning names. We're not talking about mentioning names. But we are. No and sometimes we do have to mention names just to know like who's doing what, who studied where. And that's some of the questions that I, oh, who did he study with? What, this is some of the conversations that we have. Who did he study with? What did he study? How did he study? Because for the general public, when a person stands up on the member, do you know what level they are? When you go into the medical profession, you know who is a, tech, uh, 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 um, a nurse's assistant. You know who, if I say nurse, nurse's assistant, nurse practitioner, doctor, uh, 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 surgeon, specialist, like as I'm mentioning those terms, you're seeing the hierarchy, right? So are you going to go to a nurse for a surgery? You're not. And I see people go to nurse level shiuch for fetwas. They do that. And one parent at one time mentioned to me, they said, you know, uh, uh, Sheikh Rami, you know, you know, in your profession, you know who's who, you know, and it's very quick. It's just like a lawyer it says, okay, what did he study? Where did he study? Who did he study with? They know how to put them wh where they go. For us, we can do the same because we know where everybody, where everybody fits and we know what their capacity is. Like I was talking about last night, the level of authority. If you are a hafiz of the Quran and you're teaching qira'ah, don't talk about tafsir. Don't talk about fiqh. If you're a faqih, don't talk about tafsir if you don't know it. Don't talk about hadith if you don't know it. And, 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 and know where your level, even in those various sciences, uh, sciences are. So, we have those discussions in our, in our groups just so that we know that if somebody comes and says, oh, should I go and seek a fatwa from so-and-so? I want to be able to say, no, not from him, from him. So an answer to that, that's an answer to, 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 your, to your question. And then you as the general public, you should feel comfortable in asking about shuk. So what is his level exactly? Don't think just because a person grew a beard, went overseas, wears a thobe, is in a masjid, that you can ans ask them uh, a fatwa issue. Uh, that you can ask them necessarily marital advice. When I studied the fiqh of marriage, was I trained as a marriage and family counselor? Marriage family therapist? No, I wasn't. I studied the fiqh of marriage for seven months, but I wasn't uh, 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 trained as a counselor. So why do people come to me for marriage counseling? Why do people go to shiuch for business advice? Why do they go for them? You know, you can, you can, I can tell you what a marriage is, what a marriage is not, what are the responsibilities, what is a divorce, what is not a divorce, what's the dowry. I can tell you all of that. I can't untie all of those knots in your marriage and you know, going back to your relationship and go, maybe going back to your childhood. I can't do that. I should be able to work with somebody in that profession. And it's a mutual respect of, of, of the professions. Uh, but we have, to, um, uh, we have to... I know I kind of went on a tangent, Dr. Shadi, but... Uh, okay. Yeah. Exactly. And to maintain a professional standards. One of the things that I'm suggesting to people, I'm talking to other people in this profession, is that just like there's a bar association and the physicians have an association, there should be a whatever you want to call it, clergy, sheikhs, imam, teachers of the deen, professional association. And just like a lawyer, if they do something that's unethical or illegal, they could get disbarred, right? And no longer practice law. Why don't we have that with our shiyu? Why don't we? It's in the Quran. There's certain people, if they do certain things, don't accept their shahada ever again. You can be a Muslim. Hey, that's fine. You know, we may come and, 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 and we'll be your friend or other. You're not going to be in a position of the deen. That's it. You lost it. One strike, you're out. Because this is too, this is too uh, sensitive of a position. I mean, in this position of the deen, people can come to me and I can, and I can uh, put marriages together through my advice and through my answers, I can move uh, people apart. I can move uh, uh, people from their parents. I can put parents uh, together because people are trying to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through studying the deen. They have to come to a representative who has studied the deen. My answer is going to impact their, their relationship. Is that, a, is that a stretch of the imagination? Or is that the reality? Yeah. Could I cause marriages and separate marriages? 
So this is very, very sensitive, uh, sensitive work, just like a surgeon with his tool, just what, like a lawyer with his, with his books and his knowledge of the law. So we should have a professional standard. And now I'm talking to the camera. I'm not talking to, my, uh, to the uh, teleprompters. I don't have teleprompters, so I'm talking to all of the shoe uh, out there. There should be a professional standard, and it's coming. We're working on it. And there are going to be shoes that are going to be disbarred. And that's it. You can go flip burgers in McDonald's. And I'm not exaggerating. I'm saying, hey, why not? If a sheikh makes a it falls, and I'm talking about some of those big falls, big falls. If you, if you abuse your authority and you fall, go, go be a janitor. Go flip burgers. There's nothing wrong with that. But you're not going to abuse this position of the deen. Unshake. Go make, he can be the milkshake at McDonald's. <laughs> Any questions and we'll take a five minute break? We take a five minute break. There are sandwiches from Douglas Pizza that have what's put out a table. So you can pick up a quick sandwich and come back. Okay, we'll go ahead and take a five minute break. I'll end on that. We'll take a commercial break. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>